All right, so we are live. So welcome. So in the Solution Life Facebook group, you're watching this. Uh, this is Dr. Heather and Dr. Steve again. So we're going to be talking today about what is you know what are things that we can do for longevity and to reduce uh, illness risk. And how this is going to work is as you're watching us talk about some of this information, I want you to hopefully interact with us by clicking in the comment section. And you can just type in whatever questions that you may have, or if you currently are experiencing specific symptoms, or if you've been labeled right by a doctor with something, this is a great place for us to kind of discuss some, some information about what that label means for you and what are some options beyond the typical medicine route of this drug for that symptom, right? So we can get a little bit deeper if you participate and comment in the section. So awesome, let's jump right into it. Um, I'll set the framework. So um, like all previous videos and information I've posted, a lot of information discusses, you know, how our, our current medical system in every which way I believe, and I'm sure, you know, Dr. Heather shares this same sentiment, which is it is, it is pretty broken, right? It, it's still operating under the system of, let's collect some data um, using a system that's 40 plus years old and really hasn't been updated. And we're only going to collect less than 5% of the available data. And we're really letting the labs, like a sheet of paper, tell us what's normal, not normal. Uh, and we gloss over it. And if nothing's in the red, then quickly we'll tell you you're fine so I can move on to the next patient. But if something's in the red, I will use my um, strongly influenced um, brain because drug reps have been knocking on my door for the last X number of years I've been practicing to buy me lunch. I will match um, that drug with that symptom in that column that you are read in, right? That's how I see medicine right now, right? And so, um, and now granted the, the caveat is that's the system. I'm not saying doctors are, are you know, quote unquote, not, not doing their thing. That's just a system that they operate in. I think every doctor has the best intentions to, uh, to help humans. It's just that they're operating in what is a pharmaceutical and insurance control system right now. And so some things that we're going to talk about uh, in this video is, well, what are some options outside of that system, right? And what's interesting is that I just spoke yesterday at this event. It's like, it's like the future of medicine. Imagine if we could test for things way before you ever get it um, and test for things accurately to see if you have it and also actually, you know, look at the root cause of the things and then remove the root cause. And guess what happens when we remove the root cause? Your body um, basically removes all symptoms of that thing. That's like the future of medicine that's available like today, right? It's actually been available for many years. And so what's exciting about this is if you're watching this, you're like, I want, I wish the future was here now. Well, the good news is it's here, right? Like it's available right now. And so with all that framework, uh, my question, um, Heather, is let's talk about what are some tests that you have typically um, used on patients, like over 10,000 patients, to identify some things that traditional doctors are not seeing? Um, and um, what are you able to do with that data? So let's talk about that. Okay, so um, I think we have to start with my one of my favorites, which is mm -hmm. the food sensitivity testing. Yeah. Because it's never even looked at. Mm -hmm. And the one that we use, I mean, sometimes you'll get IgG or IgE for people that are like anaphylactic to fish, where if they eat fish or peanuts, then their throat closes and they're in danger of dying, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's different than what we do. Yep. What we do is we identify foods that are raising inflammation in the body because inflammation is the cause of just about all of the damage that your body undergoes. So just about every single disease is an inflammatory process and problem mm -hmm. where it's it has a job in the body that it should be doing for healing, and yet it becomes out of control, like cancer is an inflammatory disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, just to name like the top big three, right? Yeah. They're all based on inflammation. And so there's different reasons and places where that inflammation can come from. And the things that you're putting into your body day to day can either help you or hurt you. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I can't remember who said it, but like your, your food can either be... Um, something that supports your wellness or slowest kind of death. Mm -hmm. Because, and it's not just, well, I don't eat McDonald's. Uh, well, that's not it. That's not all it. Like you can't eat broccoli, correct? Right, it's like a superfood, one of the best foods on the planet, and yet it increases your inflammation. And so you don't, I mean, 
yeah. and we have to find another that's place. Garlic. That's the, that, <laughs> for me, you know, as a lover of food, garlic is on my list. So, yeah. Yeah. It can be painful. I was just thinking about it the other night. I'm like, yep, I gave up that. I gave up that. I gave up that. Mm, that wasn't even worth it. And, you know, so that's one of the big things. And I think we've talked a lot about that. Um, another piece, which is really the elephant in the room and is becoming like an integrative medicine and functional medicine, um, they're really starting to pay a lot of attention, finally, uh, with toxicity because we are inundated with all of these different toxins from everything. I mean, everything from not only carpets, paint, but perfume. If you're not using an essential oil, perfume is a cancer causing endocrine disruptive chemical and people wear it every day. Um, and I used to get perfume every single holiday or you know birthday because I loved it so much and I haven't worn it in years just because it's one of those other ways that you can decrease your body's likelihood of developing something, some disease process. So we can test those toxins in the body. We can test for heavy metals. We can test for other um, like volatile chemicals. We can look for glyphosate or Roundup amounts in your, in your body. And then we can detoxify you to get those out so that, you know, this major driver or cause of chronic disease is lessened in your body. Um, I'm starting to explore, because I did integrative oncology and treated patients who were going through chemotherapy and radiation or had opted out in order to support their body to have less symptoms um, and side effects from those conventional therapies um, that I'm going to stay away from trash talking about right now. Yeah, but yeah. like the fact that uh, radiation for breast cancer can actually create treatment resistant cancer stem cells that are then able to metastasize and go over to go to other parts of the body and then they don't react to radiation or chemotherapy anymore. Yeah. yeah. And so it, that's mind blowing. So but how about we get rid of all of these estrogenic chemicals that are definitely a cause in, you know, these endocrine or you know, breast cancer issues, as well as help the body detoxify and heal in a different way. So I'm starting to pay more attention to um, not only how your genetics handle certain things like hormone cascades and um, your immune system function and your detoxification processes, but I think it's kind of funny, you know, when you're talking about these labs, let's take PSA, for example, mm -hmm. prostate specific antigen, which yep. is one of the most ironic names ever, but because one of the highest levels was actually found in a breast cancer patient. So it's not really specific at all, right? Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. But yeah. like, so you have this range that goes from, you know, like 0.4 to four or um, depends on the lab. And so as you get up higher, once you hit four, oh, time for a biopsy, time to pay attention, time to worry about this and um, so what we want to do is we want to look at, so if you're in the top 75% before you go over, let's look, even if you look at like um, ovarian cancer markers or like breast cancer markers or GI or endocrine, other issues, right? So if you're in the top 75% of that range, let's look at how are you detoxifying? How are you metabolizing your hormones? Do you have issues genetically that are keeping you from doing this well. So it's not a perfect screen by any means. Um, it's a good baseline though, I think, because then we know, because normal cells can in certain situations make, right? And we all have cancer in our body. Probably mm -hmm. even you, Steve, you yeah. might have five cancer cells while everybody else has 5,000, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, takes like, it takes like 10 to 15 years for a lot of these things to become detectable. And by that time, yeah, you're you're in trouble. Yeah, and it's so interesting. Like literally, imagine if you had like your PSA test. It doesn't matter any levels. And let's say in the last five years, like it starts here. And let's say this is the normal range, camera, but normal range right here. And it's gone from like here to here to here to here to here. The doctors be like, oh, it's fine. Yeah, it's still normal. It's across the threshold, but it's, it's like totally normal. It could have like doubled, quadrupled, right? Right. And they're like, yeah, it's fine. Because they're looking yeah. at like slicing nope. yes. data. Yeah. Yes, it's an algorithm based. And while there's nothing wrong with algorithms, 
I'd like to change them so they were a little bit more specific yeah. Yeah. and preventative. Yeah, just using more data, right? Like instead of limited, it's still an algorithm just actually, but now using more data to kind of figure out the right. algorithm. So. Right, and so if we run those cancer markers, and even if they're good, and then we run them again in a year as part of your, part of your checkup, and they go up, that's something to pay attention to. Yeah, so it's funny when you said about the cancer cells, like five, and most people have like 50,000. So uh, so yesterday I was in Baltimore speaking to um, 30, 35 entrepreneurs. And so so I bought the the S3 scanner. It's like a scanner that measures the carotenoid levels, like antioxidant levels. And so one person maxed out the machine. Like it only goes up to 89,000 and his score is 89,000. So it's Brian, right, partner in, in this stuff. And uh, yeah, because he's like so on top of his health. It was impressive. Yeah. I, so when I calculated the group average yesterday of the entrepreneurs, I had to, I had to say like his was such an outlier. It skewed the group average up by 5,000. I was like, I had to exclude his number to get a true accurate score of the, of the entrepreneurs, which was 34,000 on that score, which is still better. Like the average masses, like everyday population will be test 25. So they're about 10,000 above the average but still below uh, what they're, that they're still in the slight danger zone on average for people. But anyway, so that, that was an interesting, interesting data point. Yeah. So I think it's to me, and I think you would agree, it's all about data, right? Just like if we have enough data, you know, we can figure out, I think everything. Um, and maybe we can talk about like, uh, I've throughout general numbers, right? Which is like the, the numbers show we can test for about 4,000 different markers right now. And a traditional doctor tests for about 20. And that's, if you think about it, that's like mind blowing. They're, they're using. Such but they're all normal, so you're fine. Yeah. And so there's that. So we can talk about like, so we talked about, you know, some tests that are, that are great. Maybe let's go to the other side, but like, you know, what are some tests um, that they're currently doing that maybe actually not showing what it should be showing, right? Like the accuracy of those tests, maybe we can touch upon that. We've touched upon it in other videos, but I'm assuming that everyone's going back and watching favorites. every video. Yeah. My favorites. Yeah. So let's talk about thyroid. Yeah. I'll try to keep my language clean. So <laughs> We're all adults, it's okay. <laughs> so when you go and get a, th get a thyroid, like, I'm tired and I just don't have any energy and I'm getting weight, you know, I'm having some hair loss, maybe my digestion isn't working as well as it should. And so if you twist their arm enough, often they will run a TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from the pituitary and goes down into the thyroid to stimulate your um, T4 and T3 production, mostly T4, however. So the TSH is actually like sitting down with my grandmother to get to know me because from the active form of thyroid is T3. And there's actually a reverse form of T3 that can also feed back in a negative loop to TSH and so can lower TSH into a normal range and yet be inner in the body. We see this a lot with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, people under chronic stress. A lot of people like with hair loss have elevated T reverse T3 and it's almost never checked. Mm -hmm. So then T3 by itself or free T3 and free T4 are also very often never checked. And T4 is made in the thyroid about, I guess it's about 80% is made in the thyroid uh, or what the thyroid makes 80% is T4. And then it goes out into the tissues and gets converted into T3. Mm -hmm. If you're under stress, you don't convert to T3 as well. If you don't have enough vitamin D, you don't convert to T3 as well. Um, there's other enzymes like selen or other like selenium is another thing that's necessary, which a lot of us don't have enough selenium because our foods don't contain enough of it to really help everything in the body because selenium is also needed for detoxification in the liver. And it's a very important piece of hormone synthesis, especially in the prostate, et cetera. So why would you just look at TSH? Because it's not even what matters. And yet people, then there's the range, right? So it's like 0.45 to 4.5. Right, if you're 4.4, you're totally fine. Normal, come back in three months, we'll test again. So then in three, what's gonna happen in three months if you don't do anything? Well, you're probably gonna get worse. And then at 4.5, maybe 4.6, here's your prescription. 
Yeah, last yeah. night, last night, yeah. night when our uh, hair lines, the four pounds weight gain, recent stress, recent stress, stress, that everything was fine. Everything was fine. Everything's fine. And so if your T, everything is fine. So if your TSH is over two, I know that some it's struggling. And so that's when we can do things that can support the proper functioning of the thyroid gland. So you don't necessarily have to go on a replacement hormone. Um, there's been a huge upsurge in hypothyroid in babies in California since 2011. It's increased 30%. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting hit with a lot of the radiation from Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's another, because people's thyroids are not well. I've got two brothers in Southern California where a lot of that stream hits and both of them are having issues. Yeah. Because yeah. in the Cold War, with bomb shelters in the bottom of the house, right? What was kept in there to protect the thyroid? Potassium iodide, because radioactive iodine replaces the healthy iodine in the thyroid. And so you take iodine to keep it functioning, otherwise you die. Mm -hmm. And so where do we get iodine in our diet here? Well, kelp, maybe, seafood, which we're not supposed to eat because it's so toxic, and iodized salt, which everybody's so scared of eating because that salt's going to raise their blood pressure, which is another crazy thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, taking a, <laughs> so taking a little bit of iodine can really be fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah. The other part, the other test that goes really well with the thyroid is adrenal testing. Mm -hmm. And in convention, they'll run often, will run like an 8 a.m. morning cortisol to see where you are in the morning when you wake up in the blood. Nice. <laughs> I like your picture, Steve. <laughs> uh-huh. I can't wait to find out what's in that. Sounds good. I love clove. I think clove is like an under championed, awesome powerhouse of an herb. It's like the Orax, Orax, charts. It's amazing. It's awesome. It's good. It's yeah. We can talk about that next time. But yeah. um, so cortisol, you can, if you're in the hospital, sometimes they will run a four blood test cortisol because what happens to cortisol, it goes up in the morning to wake you up and then it should go down over the day in a, in a um, circadian rhythm. So if you just look in the morning, that's just like, it's like having a screenshot of a movie, right? And so then if you're in the hospital, you can get those four blood draws. Or if you want to camp out of, at a phlebotomist, then you can get those four blood draws to get more of an idea of the curve. Mm -hmm. But what convention usually does, if they think that there's an adrenal issue, is they give you a 24-hour urine assessment. Mm -hmm. And you pee in a bucket for 24 hours, and then they just take the co total cortisol that you excrete right. and say, well, that total cortisol is in range, so you've got to be fine. It doesn't give any kind of idea about what the curve is doing. Yeah. And I've seen reversed yeah. curves. I've seen super high and then boom, you know, or just kind of like very, very low level with no real jump in the beginning. And so it's so, it's nuts. Yeah. And I don't do yeah. a whole lot of salivary testing because I think that, you know, it depends on good lymph function. It depends on how well hydrated you are. But salivary cortisol is something that I do because it's the most convenient to get a yeah. pretty good yeah. idea of what's going on, especially with the four, the four um, tests. I actually have one that does five for people that wake up in the middle of the night because yeah. then we want to know, like, why are you waking up in the middle of the night? Yeah. And yeah. so you can do that one, and then you've got four others during the day to see what the curve's really doing. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. You know, it's funny. Once you find one, you can complete simply. You may want to test one test removal instead of dumping the whole thing in the average. But want to talk about so this is like one of my favorite subjects, Steve. I could talk a long time about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> lipid testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! It's so bad. it's so bad. I mean, no wonder cardiovascular disease kills more Americans than anything else because yeah. it's so bad, both in assessment and management. Mm -hmm. So your total cholesterol numbers mean very, 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 very little. Even if you look at your LDL or your bad cholesterol combined with your HDL, which is supposedly your healthy cholesterol, mm -hmm. and then you can look at ratios and things and triglycerides. That's what the usual lipid panel looks at. Yep. Yeah. Which, and then they'll give you a statin drug to lower that LDL, 
but a lot of times the statin drug actually raises the small dense particles that are more likely to get into the lining of the vessels and cause plaque and what causes heart attacks and stroke <laughs> plaque. and most of the time ldl um, treatment plans like statin drugs do not decrease plaque and so we look at whether there's plaque being formed we look at what size and shape your particles are are they big fluffy beach balls or are they small little baseballs because that matters and then we have natural substances that we can give to help remove plaque from the vessels as well as change the way that um, the pro the particles are sized yeah yeah it's uh, it's, uh i remind patients that um, I believe it's like 64% of people have heart attacks and heart attacks and your doctor is just doctor. So there's something else going on. Well, the 52-year-old head of the American Heart Association had a heart attack about a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they knew, he, and they, he lived, but they knew he was at risk. He had a familial health risk. He did their therapies, and he still had a heart attack. Yeah, again, it goes back to this back to this down, back to the operating, the operating mm -hmm. is just outdated, outdated. Mm -hmm. So, yep. so those are some things that we know uh, uh, just really doesn't work. Doesn't work. What about, so let's go what back, let's go back. Someone wanted to uh, uh, find out their, find out their formula, ask for who that test, who that test. Okay, so we run, um, we look at the LPPLAC, which is an enzyme that is released when plaque is being formed in the arteries. So we can look at that. We look at the size and shape of the particles. We look at the particle number. We look at omega fatty acids because one of the accepted ways to lower cholesterol in a healthy way is using healthy fats. And they're also very anti-inflammatory. So we look at whether you're getting enough because a lot of people are taking fish oil, but are they taking a good enough form? Are they absorbing it? And are the levels appropriate for their body? And so we look at that. Yeah. Um, we look at um, high sensitivity CRP to look and see about the inflammation in the vessels, homocysteine for a similar reason to see about the oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. um, those are the big ones, but because diabetes is a major driver of cardiovascular disease, then we also look at those metabolic risks. Like, what is your glucose? I'll tell you what, your glucose fasted in the 90s, that's not good. I mean, I want to see it in the 80s or lower, yep. you know, because yep. that shows better glycemic control. And when we look at longevity, one of the best things to do for longevity is to manage your blood sugar. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so if you're in the 90s, that means that we have got to get your insulin sensitivity better. We've got to see what we can do in your diet. And then we can also run a score looking at the insulin in relation to your glucose in relation to your hemoglobin A1C and see what are your likelihood What's the likelihood of you becoming diabetic in the future? Yeah. And so sometimes yeah. people are like, oh, whew, okay, <laughs> yeah. let's really do yeah. something now. I've got to give up, got to give up the, you know, martinis or whatever. Yeah, I, I think it's a movement that we're in a time, time technology, medicine, and a ten measure you know, you'd be like, like you're at, you're at you know, or low risk of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. yeah. Versus currently, currently, let's wait until you wait until you like, then do something about it. Right. Yeah. And then we can look at, you know, vitamin D too. And a lot of doctors are running vitamin D now, mm -hmm. but yeah. optimal levels yeah. of vitamin D are between 60 and 80. And a lot of people aren't even close to that. And so yeah. you may be normal, but are you optimal? Yeah. 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 And there's, there's, yeah. A, there's kind of this bunch of the, the, the yeah. variation in the body that body that you had. Uh, that's not being done. Not being so, so. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, are there any other there any other like cardiovascular markers? Maybe do we talk about we talk about cancer marker marker? We can talk a little about cancer. A about cancer. So I, as far as the cancer markers go, you there's markers that you can look at for like ovarian cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. There's even some for thyroid. Um, there's the CEA, which is uh, chorionic, like chorionic embryonic antigen or 
cancer embryonic antigen, which is a GI risk um, risk factor, and it shows that if you have like GI mutations, um, like colon cancer or esophageal things like that. Um, so those are some of the big ones. Yeah, and so, yeah, so, so these are again, again, all just wood. I'm, I'm sorry, Steve, you're breaking up. Yep, yep. These are tests. These are tests. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So these okay. are tests that these are tests that you wouldn't run. Like, what's the, 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 like, what's the, like, what's the, right? From a predicted from a value, value, value of, uh, early or not, early or not, value, 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 value. In general, talk about how to uh, relate uh, to this, uh, this is the traditional way. Traditional way. Yeah. For the cancer yeah. detection? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like, it's um, ability to detect the tumor, how early, how early, versus, well, I versus think, the tumor, um, tumor. I mean, if you get regular tumor markers and we see the progression, right? So if you're in the top 75%, that's something for us. It's not that we're gonna be able to say, oh, you know, in three years you're gonna have it, right? Because there's a little bit of wiggle room. But if we get it and you're in the top 75%, that tells us we need to look a little bit deeper and see why, and then address that why, and then retest and see where is that number. And so I think that by themselves, they're kind of like a warning light, mm -hmm. you know, and then, I think, I mean, we could find things with that warning light and prevent, you know, something that could be found in 10 years or, or more. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Perfect. yep. So, so what would be the other things that would be the highest person, highest person? So, so let's take um, the cancer detection. Yeah. 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 Right, either progesterone or estrogen. You can have, you know, estrogen receptor positive cancers, and so if you have that risk, you know, or a higher cancer number, and then you either have a family history of it or you don't, then we can look at <clears throat> your fractionated estrogens, which are E1, E2, and E3. Um, E1 is a major driver of um, cancers. It's like the most active, it's the most um, aggressive. And so if you have higher ranges of that as opposed to estradiol or estriol, then that's more dangerous. And then we can look at the pathway. We can build out a pathway that shows how are you metabolizing all of these things? Where is there a backup in the enzyme system? And why is it shunting to create more of this other one? Is it an environmental toxicity? And if so, then we can test for that and we can make sure that we detoxify that out. Is it a genetic issue? Can you take that genetic piece and then make sure that you're getting enough DIM and getting enough you know, liver support in order to, and even minerals and vitamins to help that enzyme system work a little bit better so that it's chugging away and metabolizing better that way. And so like there's the genetic piece, there's the toxicity piece, and then there's the hormonal cascade piece. And with all of those, we can take that tumor marker kind of like a warning light. And you know, it's not perfect, but it's a good way, I think, to see like, are there things that are lurking on, like, there's a reason we should look under the surface mm -hmm. and make sure that your body is working as optimally as possible to really significantly decrease this cancer risk down the road. Yeah. And we can do that 100%. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. some genetic yeah. cancers, like in kids, I mean, that's another story, but yeah. like. Yeah, the common yeah, one, the common one, like breast cancer, 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 colon, endometrial, cervical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even lung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that you can find things for the why this is why this is and resolve the thing all the things you know. Yeah, so maybe that was great for your for the guys, like like through through prostate cancer, prostate cancer. Like, what are some types of what are some types of things that that's taking that that's taking? What are some common common tests for? Okay, so like prostate, like we, we would run a PSA, like we run PSAs with all of our male panels. Yep. And then yep. depending on where it is, as well as, you know, the age of the person, I mean, 
I think every man who doesn't have a food sensitivity to it should be eating pumpkin seeds, raw pumpkin seeds, because that it's kind of funny. Um, the pumpkin has uh, bioflavonoids in it that are very, very good for the prostate health. It also has selenium. And so that selenium is also very good for prostate health. Um, but if we are looking at the prostate levels and they're, you know, they're going up more and more and more every year, um, why? And then, so then we can look at what is your deep, like what's your activated testosterone? You know, what's your sex hormone binding globulin? What's your free testosterone levels? Where's your total? And then we can also run a similar cascade effect looking at, I mean, toxicity has a role in this, but a lot of times it's more, um, the like, why are you activating your testosterone so aggressively? You know, do we need to give you a like um, delta five desaturase inhibitor in a herbal form so that you're not activating your testosterone quite as quickly, which is good in some ways, but it has negative side effects as well. And so as always, men are a little bit less complicated, but you know, as, <laughs> as you, <laughs> as you, um, as you look at the hormone cascades, and you have to look at toxicity in yeah. every yeah. way. You have to, just yeah. because it's yeah. a major driver and it's just clouding the picture in different ways. Yeah. yeah. And so the genetic piece of it though too, especially if prostate cancer runs in families, then we can look at the hormone metabolism, what's going on, how do we support that? What foods can you eat? What supplements can you take? Yeah, yeah. So just so, just so people don't know, oh, no. the reason why we're going to have the and how cloud the cloud is, right? The average number, the average number right now is between the average and the average and the average and we just don't know, just don't know. Mm-hmm. right? Because there's just right. there's just really no testing. Let alone, let alone, what happens if you jump and you jump and you jump together in one or two? No idea. No idea. No idea. No. Idea. no concept and there's information coming out of uh, Europe where they're doing research and they're saying well <laughs> way lower amounts of chemicals that we have deemed as safe are actually quite dangerous to your body and your health yeah, yeah. and they're even they're like exponential when they're together yeah 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 there was a study yeah, there was a study in the water, in water, and change the sex of male frost at one at one point. If um, if I'm not, not okay, then it's like it's like one drop of this drop of this in a billion drops, billion drops was enough was enough the sex of the sex of the incredible, incredible. And you have to think like this is one of my favorite factoids because I think it's so mind blowing. <clears throat> We're basically the same age, and in our lifetime. Worldwide sperm counts have dropped fifty percent. Yeah, yeah, that's environmental. Of course, of course. And, I mean, it's because of all the estrogens and the plastics and the pesticides and like all of these other chemicals that we don't even know what they do. Fifty percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. That's assuming. That's assuming. At the rate, it's the rate, it's to it's like all of like all of like little turtle by like by like thirty or so, thirty or so. Maybe recent, maybe recent number. No. Like right. Like they're just tracking it, tracking it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so the yeah. infertility is going down, autism's going up. You know, cancer rates are going to pass. Like cancer death is going to pass. You know, cardiovascular death in twenty twenty, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. One year. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, those are just. Those are just. Awesome. Thank you. Great 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 we can we can get them out. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. We can get them out, yeah. and we can teach yeah. you how to avoid them for the most part. I mean, not perfectly because you don't have control over the sky and you don't have control over. Live in a bubble. Live in a bubble. <laughs> and the bubble would probably be plastic. Right. 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 <laughs> Right. A glass like bubble. Glass bubble. Right. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Right. 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 And, and just to, and just to, uh, to call on that note, which, that note, which is, we can pull the help. Help. But that's not but the not the the fast for two days or just drink like the water. All the out there. Yeah. 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 I mean, they do, I mean, usually what those do is they, they, 
cause you to um, burn fat. And a lot of these toxins are caught in fat. And so you will start to detox out of the fat because you're losing fat cells. But most of us can't detoxify in our liver well enough because we're deficient in the, in the nutrients needed to do that. You need magnesium and selenium and um, a lot of your activated B complexes and the liver is already inundated with, you know, vodka and, you know, prescription <laughs> drugs, and, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. else, you know, it's trying to churn through. And yeah. Yeah. so if you just stir that pot, you can actually get sicker and feel worse because you start mobilizing these things that the body has insulated in fat because it doesn't know what to do with it because it's so dangerous. And then you're just like, oh, you're free. And it goes and it can actually cause more problems. Yeah. If yeah. you're dehydrated, it's a problem. If you're constipated, it's a problem. And so we support all of those different pieces so that people are able to mobilize these toxins. Like we have um, someone go that just finished actually, and he had a history of being in a dry cleaning and a rug cleaning business. And so like all of those, chem which are the worst, all of those chemicals were causing, I think, a, a significant issue. And so he went through the detox for 30 days and just about every single thing he was complaining of, it's gone. Yep. yep. Gone. Yeah. Yeah. Magic. Magic. <laughs> the, magic of science. <laughs> the magic of data and science. The magic of data and, and nature. Data. Yeah. yeah. And just having faith yeah. in feeling that our bodies are going to feel. Yeah. All we're doing is we're doing the obstacles. Right, and so just, right. and so just other way of looking. Other way of looking. No, no, worse. So worse. So much. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So, awesome. so, end the call here. End the call here. As usual. As usual. So again, if you're watching, if you're watching, live or not live or not live, and if you have questions, or questions, or further questions, again, uh, call. I'm running on the main calendar to listen to the main calendar. Again, we can talk about a lot of stuff. So, uh, so uh, you're at this episode. Go below. Go below. Go below. Information. 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 Hear from you. Hear from you. This will be interactive. Interactive. It's only the all day. All day. Obviously, we'll be this. It's interactive. Interactive. As little as possible. Right. So, so. I know we're going to end up talking about the link. And we will talk. We will talk. Bye bye.